Okay, welcome everybody to the final talk of DevOps 2018. This is the Java Futures talk. I do a talk with a similar title every year at DevOps, but hopefully not with the same content every year at DevOps. And one of the things that's made doing this talk even more fun um, is that because we are now delivering features much more rapidly, uh, some of the things that I talked about last year as being in the future are now in the past, and we'll be able to see some of those. And you can gauge me on next year how much of what I talk about this year shows up in Java in the next year. Um, as you know, everything I say is a lie. Um, now, as a little bit of background, let me talk about how we approach evolving Java. Java's been around for a long time, more than 20 years, um, and Java is still the world's most popular programming platform, and we want that to be, continue to be the case for many, many years to come. So how do we do that? Well, the important thing is we have to stay relevant, right? Uh, we, we want people to use Java because it's useful to them. We want to stay relevant to the problems that people want to solve. We need to stay relevant to the hardware that people run on. And most of all, we need to keep the promises that we've made to our users. Um, and so as we evolve the platform, we are looking at how have things changed in the last year, how, or the last five years, or the last 10 years? How has the hardware changed? How has the problems that people want to solve changed? And make sure that the Java of today is relevant to the problems and the hardware of today. And we've been able to, um, you know, in the last few years, one of the things that we've really uh, gotten a lot better at is co-evolving the JVM and the language to deliver features that work together. Now, I talked about keeping promises to our customers, and so always, uh, as always, the prime directive here is compatibility. Java is successful now, um, in my opinion, because the code that you wrote in Java 20 years ago just works. Uh, these dusty jars that were compiled 20 years ago can still run. The source code that you wrote 20 years ago can still run. And this takes longer. One of the reasons people, uh, people often ask, why does everything take so long in Java to, to evolve? Well, the reason is it takes longer to keep our promises. Um, and that's okay. Um, it does mean that it costs more, it takes more time, but as a result, I think we get a, um, a, a better answer for the long term. And as an example of this, you, know, you can look at generics. Generics were an enormous change to the, co uh, to, to the platform, but there were never any flag days of, okay, today everyone has to recompile their code. You could migrate to generics immediately, later, or never. You could mix generic and non-generic code in the same application. Um, and there was a graceful degradation at the boundary between generic and non-generic code. That sort of um, attention to migration is how Java remains relevant and how we're able to evolve it without people saying, oh, I'm tired of this, I'm switching to something else. We did a similar kind of move with Lambdas, which was even um, sort of even more ambitious, which was to have code that was never intended to work with Lambdas work with Lambdas without recompilation. So for years, people were writing libraries that used single, uh, inter single method interfaces, and all of a sudden, those libraries without being recompiled work, work, work with lambdas, right? So you know, we, we pay a lot of attention to how do we preserve the investment people have made in their code, and we think that is the, you know, the source of Java's longevity. So language features are cool. We, as programmers, you know, we, um, you know, we think about the language all the time because it's our primary tool for doing what we do. Um, but language features are forever. We have to be very careful about what language features we choose to uh, implement, not only because we can make you know, uh, obvious mistakes, but we can make subtle mistakes where one feature interacts in a surprising way with another one. The more features you have, the more potential for interaction that you have. And so very often our guiding principle is, if we don't know the right answer today, then let's wait until we do know the right answer. Um, and, you know, with generics, this is a good example. It was 10 years before Java had generics, and that's not because in 1995 we didn't understand parametric polymorphism. We knew that it was something Java needed, but we didn't know the right way to do it in 1995. And if we, if we had forced ourselves to do it anyway in 1995, what we would have gotten was probably something more like C++ templates, and that's not what we want. So we waited until we had the right story that was consistent with, uh, you know, with, with, with the way Java worked. And you know, similar example with Lambdas. Uh, how many people here were at the DevOps in 2005, 2006 when multiple competing Lambda proposals were made? Uh, and I think everybody in the audience said, well, I want Lambdas, <laughs> but how would Java have been if we had just picked one of those proposals and implemented it? 
uh, compared to the Java that we have now when we took another five years and integrated the best uh, ideas from each of those proposals. I think the Java that we have now is much better, even though it took a little bit longer. So, you know, whatever the feature is, the way we think about it is the same. How is this going to help, uh, help make it easier for people to build and maintain reliable programs? So I keep using the word evolve because that's really what I think is happening. I think programming languages exist in an ecosystem, and when that ecosystem changes, you either have to evolve or you're going to die. And I think it's obvious, or it should be obvious, there's never going to be a perfect programming language because even if there was, the sorts of problems we solve with computers are going to change over time. And if the problem is changing, the tool that might have been perfect for yesterday's problem is not going to be perfect for today's problem. So if we want to stay relevant, we have to evolve. So, you know, it, 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 you know, to make an evolutionary comparison, imagine an ecosystem where programming languages are the predators, and the programming problems that we want to solve are the food supply, and there's an environment, you know, which is the state of computing hardware and infrastructure and all of that, and rather than talking about programming languages being good or bad, I think it's better to think about whether a language is evolutionarily fit for the environment it finds itself in. And because this environment is going to change over time, um, we, you know, a, a creature that might be evolutionarily fit in one environment um, either has to adapt when the environment changes, or if it doesn't adapt, it's not going to survive. Another part of the environment here, too, is developer expectations. Uh, developer expectations evolve pretty quickly, um, and this is part of our ecosystem. You know, I mean, if you go back and look at Java 1.0 code, um, you know, I, I started programming in Java 1.0 or maybe 1.1, and, you know, I grew to like Java and trust Java even back then, but if I look back at the code we wrote in those days, um, with all of the everything is an object and all the cast, unsafe casting, it was, it was, it's pretty awful, right? So, uh, you know, we may not have realized it at the time, but looking back, you know, the, um, the, 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 the code that we write today in Java is very different from the code that we wrote 5 or 10 or 15 years ago. So, okay, um, we're clearly not done. We're not done evolving Java, and we're probably never going to be done evolving Java because we have to continue to evolve to adapt to new problems and uh, new hardware and, and new expectations. But we also have to be mindful that it's possible for a language to get full. And by uh, full, I mean you get to the point where it is prohibitively difficult to add anything new. And so we have to pick and choose our features extremely carefully so that we forestall that point at which the evolution of the language becomes prohibitive far, far into the future. So, okay, so what's happened in the last year uh, since I stood in this very spot and talked about Java futures a year ago? Um, well, the big news is we've changed the way we deliver Java. We have a new release cadence. Starting a year ago, we moved to a six-month time-driven release cycle, and we've already delivered two full versions of Java under this new plan. So, as you'll remember in the bad old days, uh, our releases were feature-driven, uh, and typically with a two- to four-year cadence, where we hoped it was two, and more often than not, it ended up being closer to four. Um, and you know, this was bad for a number of reasons. It was difficult to accurately plan. Uh, people perceived things as moving slowly. But also, little features had a tendency to get stuck behind big features. Because if you're thinking, you know, the big features tend to crowd out all of your attention. And you know, the little features just don't get, it, get any attention. Uh, so by moving to this new, uh, this new, new model, we're able to work on a lot of things at once. And when things are ready, they book a ticket for the next train. And if a feature isn't ready, well, six months isn't a very long time. It's OK for it to miss the next train. And that eliminates a lot of distortion that happened at the boundary of features, uh, which was a, a big issue and um, you know, consumed a lot of people's attention. And so as a result, from my personal point of view, I get to spend much more time on engineering and much less time on release planning, which I think everyone in this room will agree is a good thing. So uh, in the last year, we've, um, you know, uh, la last year at DevOps, Java 9 was new. Uh, that was a big release. Since then, we've released uh, 10 and 11. Um, so 10 was the first, um, the first release under the new cadence. Uh, 11 was the first LTS release under the new cadence. And, you know, uh, there are, you know, a reasonable number of features in each, as Mark explained in his, uh, in his talk earlier this week. So we think this is working quite well. So, Let's talk about how this affects language evolution, right? So almost no language feature is going to take less than six months. So how do we do this? Well, 
the obvious way is we develop features in feature branches, and when they're ready, whether they're big features or small features, we integrate them when they're ready. And this allows us to do a mix of bigger and smaller features, um, and when something's ready, and when something fits into the story of the right order in which to, to release features, it can go on the next train. Um, and another thing that we can do under this model, which I, I think is really powerful, is we can take disruption that we know is coming in the future and break it up into small parts so that people uh, don't have to accept a lot of disruption at once, and we can lay the groundwork so that people aren't surprised by the disruption. So for example, uh, you know, for, uh, if we know that um, certain idioms will, uh, may change their behavior when Valhalla comes, what we can start doing is putting warnings in the compiler now saying, well, what you're doing is okay, but you might want to rethink it because in a year or two, uh, things might change. Um, and so this allows us not only to reduce the increment of change, but also to give people more advanced notice of disruptive change so they have plenty of time to deal with it before it becomes a fire drill. Now, the flip side of this is we have less time to gather feedback between releases. Um, that, uh, you know, which means there's an increased risk that we'll get something wrong, and language features are forever. So we, uh, we, you know, uh, there's, there's a balance to be struck, and you know, we want people to try out the new features, give us feedback, but the amount of time we have for that is no longer the full like, three-year development window like it was for Lambdas, it's much shorter than that. Okay, so let's talk about um, what features have we delivered uh, since we switched to this new uh, cadence. Um, and the big language feature that we've delivered in the last year is local variable type inference. Uh, this was added in Java 10. And what this does is it extends the type inference that Java already does for generic methods, uh, constructors of generic classes and lambdas, to local variable declarations, where if you have a local variable declaration with an initializer, the compiler looks at the type of the initializer and will let you elide the declaration of the type uh, and just say, figure it out for me. Now, this is not dynamic typing. This is plain old static typing, like we've always had in Java, with some type inference. Um, and, you know, th this is, um, Stuart had a whole talk on this yesterday, which I hope some of you attended. There's, there's a certain amount of subtlety f to deciding when should I use this, when should I not use this. When people are confronted with a feature like this, the first thing they think is, oh my god, think of the unreadable code that bad programmers will write. And, well, that's true, but there's really nothing we can do to stop bad programmers from writing unreadable code. But what we can do is offer guidelines for how to use this feature effectively to make, the co to make more readable code. And like I said, Stuart had a nice talk on that yesterday. And um, there's a, uh, a style guide for local variable type inference that captures a lot of the points that he made. Uh, but the key point here is very often the important information is in the variable name, not the type. Um, and so if the, uh, if the type is just redundant, then eliding it gets the, the reader's attention to the important part, which is the name, more quickly. It also gives people, um, it also reduces the barrier to declaring a, you know, a, new, a new variable. A lot of the time, people will squish complicated expressions together with deep nesting and chaining just out of laziness because they don't want to have to write a full type declaration and a local variable name. By reducing the overhead of doing that, I think this will encourage people to write more properly factored code. We'll have to see how this plays out. So, okay, so what are the rules here? The rules are this is just for local variables, it's not for fields, it's not for method return types, and that's because fields and method return types are part of APIs, and we want those to be stable. A lot of people say, oh, this is just syntactic sugar, that's a peeve of mine, it is not just syntactic sugar. Anything involving the type system is not just syntactic sugar, but it's actually more complicated than it looks, uh, because the Java type system is more complicated than we give it credit for. So there are some types in Java that are what we call non-denotable, they're types that exist as types in the language, but you can't actually write them down. And these include things like intersection types, capture types, anonymous class types, etc. And so they have to be given special treatment uh, with local variable type inference. So for example, if you say var c equal this dot get class, you might expect it to come back with class of question mark, but in fact it comes back with a capture type, class of capture of question mark extends whatever class this is. So this is an example of how if you ask a compiler to infer the type for you, it will give you a complex capture type, um, and that isn't necessarily the type we expected. Similarly, if I say, take a list of uh, the integer one, the integer two, and the string three, it comes back not with list of object, but 
but list of question extends serializable and comparable and dot 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 and stuff that doesn't actually fit on the slide. So the um, the type system is uh, a, a little more complicated than most people uh, notice because of these types that we don't actually write down. And so the the rules surrounding these non-denotable types are a little bit trickier. Um, so it's uh, you know for, for the case of capture types, we actually made the active decision to sanitize the type a little bit so that, uh, to eliminate the capture. For the case of uh, intersection types, we we just infer those and pass them through. So okay, why did we do this feature? Well, it was frankly one of the most commonly requested features that people would you know stop me in the hallway at DevOx and uh, say. I love this feature from C Sharp or Scala or Kotlin or wherever they first saw it. Uh, why doesn't Java have it? And you know, we certainly don't implement every feature that someone stops me in the hallway uh, and, and says something about. But when thousands of people stop me in the hallway and all say the same thing, um, I do eventually get the message. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we said we were doing this feature, the other contingent came out with their pitchforks and torches and says, you're going to destroy Java. People are going to write unreadable code. You're just, you're just giving into fashion. Well, so far, it seems to be working kind of OK. But it does kind of illustrate the common tension that we have a big community with diverse opinions. And you have people on one side that say, how could Java not have this? And other people say, how dare you think about putting this in my Java? And well, there's only one Java, so we have to try to balance the, uh, the needs of, of everybody involved, and that can take some time. Um, and it's going to take people some time to get used to, um, used to the new feature, figure out how to use it correctly and how not to use it incorrectly. Um, you know, and, and like I said, to that end, uh, Stuart has put together a pair of nice documents, a uh, style guide and, and a frequently asked questions list, uh, just to help people get started with how do I best understand this feature. OK. so. That's what we've delivered in the last year. I would have liked to have delivered more, but it's something. It was our first round uh, with the, uh, the new cadence. What do we have coming up in the next year? So Java 12, uh, feature freeze for Java 12 is like a little more than a month away. So, uh, so what have we got, we got on, on deck? Um, so first, let me talk about um, uh, a concept that we're using now when we, uh, when we put out new language features, which is what we're calling preview features. As I said earlier, because language features are forever, uh, we you know, really have to get them right. And it's hard to get them right without feedback. And when it took three years, three and a half years to do Lambda, we had a lot of time to get feedback as people downloaded the early access and gave us their experience. And with a six-month cycle, it's a little bit harder to get feedback on a timely basis. Um, and so what we decided to do is say, well, as the delivery schedule gets shorter, Let's add more stages to the pipeline so there are more opportunities for people to give feedback at the level they're comfortable. So the bleeding edge early adopters, they're going to go download the latest sources, build it themselves, try it, and that's great. But there's a lot of people who aren't going to do that, um, and we want a mechanism for them to uh, be able to see the features before they're frozen and try them out. And that's what preview features is. So the idea is that for a language or VM feature, uh, it can be a preview feature which means it's a fully specified complete feature. It's not experimental. It's not you know, half-baked. Uh, the specification is in the language. There should be support in all the tools. Uh, but we have one chance to tweak things before it becomes permanent. So it's an opportunity to put it out there where everybody can try it, um, gather broad feedback, while there's still time to make last minute changes. Um, so it would be risky to use these in production. You certainly are allowed to. But you know that means that you're a bleeding edge early adopter, and you have to behave accordingly. And our plan is that most language features will go through a round of preview for this. Um, the primary goal here of the kind of feedback that we're trying to get is, tell us something we don't already know. Right? So we, we've heard a lot of the, I like this syntax, I don't li like that syntax, and we, you know, we can we, 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 we can deal with that, but the really, kind of, the really valuable kind of feedback that we want is, I tried it in this specific situation, and I had this surprising interaction. That's the kind of feedback that we really need the community to help us with. So um, there's a JEP for what is a preview feature. If you're interested, it describes the process and describes how you use it. Uh, but essentially, you have to compile with preview people, features enabled, and you have to run with preview features enabled. Now, a lot of people say, boy, that seems like a lot of overhead. Why do I have to do it at runtime? Why can't I just do it at compile time? And the answer is, 
you don't necessarily know what's in all those jars on your class path. And we don't want people compiling uh, code that's based on preview features, putting them in jars, putting those jars on Maven Central, and having unsuspecting people depending on um, something that isn't finalized. So we make you actually say what you mean. And as of, you know, uh, of probably a month or two ago, there's IDE support for this. So in IntelliJ, when you do the little language level picker, it gives you a choice between 12 and 12 preview. So uh, you know, the, the tooling ecosystem is on the bandwagon here as well. So OK, so let's talk about our uh, first preview feature, uh, which is um, enhancements to the switch uh, construct. So a lot of uses of switch, switch is a statement, a lot of uses of the switch statement really kind of wish they were expressions. You know, in every arm of the switch, you're assigning to a common target. And this is unnecessarily indirect, and as a result, it's error prone. Uh, it's also irritating to have to break all the time when we wish break were the default. OK, we got the default wrong 22 years ago. We were copying too literally from C. Uh, OK, mistake made. We have to live with that forever. Uh, but we've been exploring uh, various enhancements to switch as part of the bigger effort on pattern matching. And what we did was we said, OK, well, pattern matching isn't done. We're going to keep, keep working on that. But these enhancements to switch, they are done. So let's ship them now. And then we'll ship more pattern matching stuff later. So uh, there are uh, two things uh, that we're doing to switch. These are two improvements uh, that can work independently or together. Uh, they're, they're kind of orthogonal. One is switch can either be a statement or an expression. Um, and there is a um, simplified form of switch labels that uh, eliminates the ugliest problems of switch, like fall through and, and break and, and, and all of that. So as an example of how this looks, here's how we have to do this today. You have a local variable, you have a switch, and in each arm of that switch, you're going to assign something to that variable, and then you have to remember to say break. And then at the end, you have to say default because you have to say default. So this is a lot of code. Um, you know, to, to, to deal with the fact that switch is basically a fairly low-level construct, right? So we have a lot of repetition. We have repeated assignment. Um, and we have a lot of repeated control flow. We have a repeated break. Um, and then finally, we have to deal with this, uh, this unfortunate bit at the end. Now, if I take both of these switch enhancements and I use them together, so turn switch into an expression, and I use the optimized form of case labels, I can reduce it to this. I say num letters equal switch. And then within my switch, I can use the, uh, the case labels with arrows instead of with colons. And that is uh, basically, I have one thing on the left, and I have one consequence on the right, whether it's one expression or one statement. And so if it's Monday, Friday, or Sunday, then the number of letters is six. If it's Tuesday, it's seven, et cetera. And Expressions, unlike statements, have to be total. You can't have an expression that doesn't yield a value in all cases. Uh, but because we're switching over an enum, we know what all the enums of day are. Uh, uh, the compiler can type check that they've all been covered. And the compiler will insert a default for you uh, just in case there's a change between compile time and runtime. And that's nice because the, uh, not only do we not have to write this kind of useless uh, thing, but the compiler is actually going to insert probably a better error message than you would by hand because you were already annoyed that you had to do it in the first place. So you can think of this, like I said, as two orthogonal improvements. You can use switch as an expression or a statement. That's one. And you have this uh, streamlined case classes where you say case, label, arrow, consequence. Um, so there's only a single thing on the right side. But if you need to do multiple things, you can put it in a block in braces. Uh, and because there's one thing on the right side, we don't have to manage fall through. Um, and then the syntactic benefit of you can put multiple labels on one line. That's kind of nice. Um, and the new form of case label basically inverts the default with respect to control flow. So you very rarely have to use break. Um, and like I said, you can use either of these independently or together, uh, that's fine. And when we get pattern matching and switch, uh, all of these forms will work nicely with pattern matching. So that's pretty cool. And that is a preview feature in 12. It's already been integrated. Uh, so um, you know, until 12 is released in, um, in uh, March, you can get early access builds, or you can wait for March and download the production builds. The other uh, early, uh, the other preview feature that we've done uh, in 12 is raw string literals. And again, uh, appealing to the people bending my ear in the uh, in the conference hall, uh, 
one of the most commonly requested things that we've gotten over the years is multi-line strings. And again, that's one of those little features that always seem to like get caught behind the big features like lambdas or generics or, or what have you. And you know, string literals are really kind of painful uh, because uh, they can't cross lines and you have escaping and that makes regular expressions painful and, thing, and it makes it hard to just cut and paste code from, you know, say, uh, uh, an HTML document into your Java code um, because you have to ma mangle it manually and you're going to introduce errors and all of that. So these are better string literals that offer, again, two, um, two new features. One is rawness, in other words, not having to deal with escaping, and the other is multi-lineness, where you can cross line boundaries. And this uh, you know, should enable the, um, uh, the code to be a lot closer to the data that you're actually describing. So the way we have to do things today, if we have a multi-line HTML literal, there's a lot of quotes and concatenation and new line literals, and those are all places to make a mistake. Um, and similarly for uh, regular expressions or file paths, you have to very carefully count the number of backslashes, uh, and it's really easy to get wrong. Or if you're embedding JSON or SQL or HTML, and, that, and those are languages that use quote characters. You have to worry about the quote characters in the embedded language conflicting with the quote characters in the uh, surrounding language. So with raw string literals, these all get a lot simpler. Uh, the multi-line string literal, uh, you know, we've gotten rid of the concatenation, we've gotten rid of the new lines, we've basically just cut and pasted that uh, snippet of HTML into, um, into our IDE. And similarly, all the extraneous backslashes go away with, uh, you know, from the regular expression and the Windows path, and uh, we do this trick here on the last one where the delimiter is actually any number of these backticks. Uh, so if you have something that uses backticks, you just pick a delimiter that has more backticks than that. So here we pick two, that works fine, and then all the stuff in the middle that uh, uses backticks, well, those aren't delimiters because the delimiter here is, is two backticks, right? So, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, the big difference is different quote character, Turning off the escaping and permitting uh, us to cross, um, you know, cross um, uh, line boundaries. So um, this feature also is already integrated in Java 12, so uh, you can go download the early access builds now and, and use it today. Um, I don't know if there's IDE support for these features specifically yet in your favorite IDE, but there will be by the time Java 12 ships. Um, so these are things that. Uh, we are confident next year when I stand up um, here, we will, have, uh, we will have shipped. So, okay, so that stuff that is like sort of already on the runway with its engine spooled up, what's on the, uh, what's on the departure board? Um, well, Java 12, probably nothing else because Java 12 feature freeze is closing in a month and we don't like to slam language features in uh, at the very end of the, uh, the cycle. So that's probably it. But we certainly have a deep pipeline of stuff we're working on. And Mark talked about a lot of these in his talk on, on Wednesday. Uh, Project Amber, Project Valhalla, Project Loom, Project Panama. Uh, there were detailed talks on Loom and Panama uh, yesterday. Um, so I'm going to talk um, uh, about some of the features from Project Amber and Valhalla. Uh, Amber, um, as uh, Mark said, is uh, trying to right-size the language ceremony, adjust the, the language to current developer expectations. Um, and Valhalla is a much more ambitious and deeper project. I've been talking about it for a long time. Some of you are probably getting tired of hearing me talk about it and not deliver anything. I feel the same way. Uh, but it is a big, deep problem that we have been working on for a long time. And we are starting to see real results now. Uh, so that's really exciting. So let's talk about some of the features uh, from Project Amber. Um, pattern matching, uh, more concise class declarations, seal types, some targeted compiler optimizations, and, and quite a bit more. I'm not going to talk about all of these today, but I will talk about a few of them. Uh, one of the big uh, sort of uh, multi-year initiatives that we're doing in the language is pattern matching. And uh, you know, la last night at my keynote, I talked about what can uh, languages like Java learn from functional languages. Well, one of my favorite features from functional languages is pattern matching. It's a way to get polymorphism that doesn't require uh, burning it into your class hierarchy. And sometimes that's the right way to uh, to, to to do it. We've pretty much identified how we're going to chop this feature up and deliver it in smaller pieces. So the first phase, we're going to start simple with patterns and instance of. And we're going to start with a simple kind of patterns called type patterns. So we write code like this all the time. If this thing is an instance of integer, then what do we do? Cast it to integer. Why do we have to do that? 
We just asked if it was an integer, right? Uh, now, some people think the answer here is float typing. Uh, there's actually a much, much better answer here, which is pattern matching. Um, but what we care about here is making the actual business logic pop up uh, so that it's not obfuscated by all the boilerplate of testing and casting and extraction and, and, and all of that. And that's what pattern matching does. Pattern matching, uh, pattern is, imagine I'm fusing a test, which is, do you have this characteristic, with the, if the uh, a conditional extraction, which is, uh, okay, you do have this characteristic, let me pull out this field, or let me cast it to something, or what have you, and bind those to fresh variables in the middle of an expression. So, um, you know, r right now we have to uh, repeat the, uh, the, t uh, the uh, you know, integer twice. We say, are you an integer? Okay, cast to an integer. That's, you know, that's the error-prone repetition we'd like to get rid of. Um, and so what we're going to do is fuse that into a type pattern. So a type pattern looks an awful lot like a variable declaration, not by accident. You have a type name and a variable name. And then you can put one of these patterns on the right side of instance of. So we say, instead of saying, if object instance of integer, we say if object integer in instance of integer and then a variable name. And what that means is if it's an integer, cast it to integer and bind it to that variable name. And then I can just use the variable that's in scope inside the if block. Now, this is a simple kind of pattern. There are other kinds, uh, and there are other places like switch and um, uh, that, you know, that we'll be able to use them. So we're going to start with type patterns and instance of first. And you know, the side benefit of that is I predict that once people adopt this feature, nearly 100% of the casts in Java code can just go away. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, and by having those casts go away, the intent of our code becomes clearer. And it also removes an opportunity to make an error. Um, so this works also very nicely with the short-circuiting Boolean operations. So for example, here's how I would write equals um, in, uh, with pattern matching, uh, which has the nice characteristic that my equals method is a single expression. It doesn't have this complicated control flow of, well, if it's not this, return false, and then do, it, I, I can write it out as, is the other thing an instance of whatever class I am? If so, bind it to T, and then, compare my size to that size and my name to that name, and if they're all equal, then the two things are equal. Um, and so that is a much cleaner way to write, uh, to write an equals method. Um, you know, uh, and if you look at the, um, you know, the control flow of what gets generated uh, by your IDE, or as Venkat says, what gets vomited by your IDE, it's not really code that we want to read. Uh, this is much closer to code that we want to read. Similarly, um, when we look a little bit ahead, uh, how would we use this in switch? We can do the same thing. And again, if you look at where the repetition is, we're uh, repeating the test and the cast. We're repeating the, uh, the instance of test. Is the same thing an instance of this? Is the same thing an instance of that? And we're repeating the capturing of, uh, of, the re of a result in, in a common variable. So this is how we have to write it today. It's kind of annoying. But with pattern matching, we can make this a lot prettier. So the first thing we can do is replace all of those instance of tests with pattern instance of tests. And as a result, all the casts go away. So that's great. The code is already more readable. It's more, already more obvious what this code does. But then we combine it with the expression switch feature that, we've, that we're already shipping, well, already integrated as a preview feature. I, I live entirely in the future. So um, uh, you know, we, we can compress this down much more. And this is not about concision. This is about readability. If you look at this code where you say, OK, switch on this constant. Is it an integer formatted as an integer? Is it a byte formatted as a byte? That's kind of the code that we had in our head when we sat down to write it. But that wasn't what we were able to write. What we ended up writing was this horrible code. right? And so when the code that you know, in the IDE looks more like the code in your head, it's less likely to be wrong. Okay, so um, pattern matching is a really nice fit for switch, but wait, there's more. Um, the patterns rabbit hole goes pretty deep. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, there's many more kinds of patterns than just simple type patterns, and there's more constructs that can use them. So, for example, uh, a constructor takes uh, some state and fuses it into an aggregate, right? So if I say new point x, y, I'm saying take my x and y value and wrap it with a point. I'd like to be able to reverse that operation where we say, if you're a point, cast it to a point and give me your x and y and bind them so that I can use them, right? So that's what a deconstruction pattern does. So for example, um, you know, uh, 
if your class has a deconstructor that's designed to yield up its state, and not all classes will, because some may want to encapsulate its, their state, um, you can uh, deconstruct uh, an object with a syntax that's actually fairly similar to constructing an object. And that similarity, again, is not accidental. So uh, if circle has a deconstructor that yields up its center and radius, we can say, um, if this shape is instance of circle, and then var center var radius, I can use those inside that, uh, that instance of or inside that switch label. Um, and deconstruction patterns aren't magic. They're class members just like constructors. We're not going to magically guess what this means based on the field names or something like that. But it seems likely that we might want to design some of our classes for easy destructuring, and the language will provide you a way to do that. Um, and in fact, it's my belief that we've been working around the lack of pattern matching in object-oriented languages for years and, and didn't actually know it. So here's an example uh, from an API that has been around since Java 1.0, which is the Java Lang class class. Uh, and there are two methods on Java Lang class for dealing with class arrays. There's is array, does this class represent an array class, and get component type. And the way you're supposed to use them is you call one and say, are you an array? And if it says yes, then you call the get component type and you can work with it. But there's nothing about the API that forces you to do it right. You could call get component type with no confidence that it's an, that it's an array class. And what's that? That's a bug, right? Um, and so we've written, you know, by, by shredding this single operation into two API points, we've made it possible to use it incorrectly. But really, these two things form a pattern. Um, and if, I had if we had written this as a pattern back in 1995, which obviously we couldn't do, what we would have said is, if a class instance of array class var component type. And that fuses the test and the, extra and the dependent extraction into a single operation so that we can't use it wrong. So adding pattern matching to Java will give us the ability to write better APIs. And writing better APIs means there will be a richer variety of libraries out there for people to use. Now, we can use deconstruction patterns and switch when patterns and switch are available. So for example, here's how we might like, compute the area of a shape by casing over all the different kinds of shapes. So let's say we have an interface shape, and there are subtypes for circle and rectangle. And a circle has a center and a radius, and a rectangle has two bounding points. And how do we compute the shape? Well, we say, are you a circle? If so, extract your center and your radius and compute pi r squared. And are you a rectangle? If so, extract your lower left and upper right and compute delta y times delta x. And when we get to sealed classes, when we're able to say a shape is a circle or a rectangle and nothing else, we won't even need that default clause. Right? So pattern matching works very nicely uh, because it anticipates what we want to do with the data. When we say, are you a circle, there's a good chance the next thing we're going to do is say, get me your center, get me your radius. So let's integrate that into one operation. OK, so pattern matching is really cool. We're going to be uh, doling out little bits of it uh, over, over time. You know, the, the, the first installment will be uh, type patterns and instance of, um, and then patterns and switch, and then deconstruction patterns, and nested patterns, and, and more, more patterns, and it'll be very cool. So OK, let me talk about another feature that I haven't talked about before. And uh, that is, um, there, are some, uh, there are some methods in the, uh, the class library, like string.format um, or objects.hash, that are sort of the ideal way to write the equals and the toString method. And that's kind of important, because every class has an equals and a two-string method, right? How many people write equals and two-string for every one of their classes? You know you should. You should eat your vegetables, too. Um, so uh, now a lot of people say, well, I don't want to use string.format to write two-string because it's slow. <coughs> Anybody ever heard that? Yeah, OK, it is true. It's slow. Um, why is it slow? Well, it's a var args method. So if we're going to pass, say, primitives to it, those get boxed into objects. And then the, 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 the arguments get boxed into a var args array. And then the, um, the format string is almost always a constant. It's almost always a quoted string. But every time you call string.format, we interpret that string. Well, that's kind of silly. So people don't use it. Uh, and that's unfortunate because they write harder to read, more error prone code because they want it to be faster. So our trick for getting people to stop doing that is to make the obvious thing fast so that we take away their excuse for writing bad code. Um, and we actually have an alternate translation. It's, uh, it's actually fairly simple where we can get 
20, 40, 60x performance improvement on string.format, which is to say you will have absolutely no excuse for not using it. Um, and this means that you know, the, um, the, the hash code and two-string methods can be simple one-liners that call the appropriate API and just, just do the obvious thing. Um, and so this is, again, an example of a little feature we might not have done um, you know, uh, when, when we were focused on big long-term feature orcs. But it's the sort of thing that it's, it's a little thing. We figured out how to do it. We're pretty satisfied with the solution. We can put that in. OK, so now let me talk about a bigger project that as you know, some of you know, I've been talking about for a while, which is Project Valhalla. So this is not something that's going to be coming in 12 or 13, but we've made some really impressive progress towards it. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I think we've really turned the corner on it. The aim of Project Valhalla is to sort of reboot the relationship between the language, uh, between the JVM and the memory uh, of the underlying hardware. And the reason this is so important is, if you think about how hardware has changed in the last 25 years, uh, it's changed tremendously. And as the structure of memory subsystems have changed tremendously, it used to be that the cost of a arithmetic operation, the cost of memory fetch, were about the same. So, you know, uh, 30 years ago, these were generally each a handful of cycles, three, four, five cycles to go to memory, three, four, five cycles to do an arithmetic op. As our memory systems have gotten more complicated with more layers of caching, the difference between them is enormous. So uh, operating on something that's already an L1 cache, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, like on the order of one cycle. Going out to main memory is on the order of 300 cycles. Big difference, and that's a, you know, that's a big change in the last 25 years. In addition, processors today can issue um, often two, four, eight instructions per, uh, per cycle. Um, so ideally, if you can keep the CPU fed with data on a typical um, you know, i7 chip, you can do four arithmetic operations per cycle. But the problem is it's very hard to keep the CPU fed with data. And so the, CPU, so the cores spend a lot of time waiting for the memory subsystem to cough up the data. Now, it turns out you know, that um, if you look at the way Java lays out data in memory, it has a lot of indirections. It has a lot of pointers. Um, and that's because almost everything in Java is an object. And that was probably the right philosophy in 1995. But it, it, um, it saddles us with a cost, a memory access cost, that we might not always want to pay. And not all things need to be objects. So why make all objects pay for them? So to make this, um, make this concrete, um, let's look at the data layout that we get today. We have our simple point class. We have an array of points. So an array is an object with an object header and then a bunch of slots for each of the elements. And when the elements are references to objects, what we put in that array is pointers. And those are pointers to other objects that have their own header and their data payload. So for each x, y point, we have two words of actual data, x and y. We have two words of object header. And we have another word of pointer overhead. So that's like, you know, uh, that, 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 that's a, you know, a significant uh, over um, a significant factor by uh, where the memory is not being used for, for for useful data. It limits how much data that we can get in a reasonable working set, and it also means that when I want to get to those x and y values, I have to take a pointer jump. I have to risk taking a cache miss, um, and as a result, my processor is going to be waiting for data, and I'm back in that potentially 300 uh, 300 cycle wait. Um, and in addition, this makes more work for the GC, make, makes more work for the allocator. Uh, there's all sorts of things that are not necessarily optimal about this kind of layout. So sometimes developers in the, um, in the search for performance will do ugly things like this, where I'll say, I don't need an array of points. I'll just have an array of x's and y's. That's perfectly OK, but this code is going to be a lot harder to maintain. Um, and you know. Developers often have relatively poor intuition about when they need to mess up their code for performance reasons. And so you will see people messing up their code like this for no good reason at all, because they actually don't have a performance problem at all. Um, or if they do, they don't have performance requirements or metrics to like, legitimately tell them wh what it is. Um, so 
you know, we don't want people to do this unnecessarily because it makes their code less readable, more error prone, and less maintainable. And you know, in our charitable, uh, most charitable viewpoint, we could say this is our fault because we're putting developers in a position where they feel like they have to choose between abstraction and performance. Uh, because we can't necessarily figure out when um, a data structure is never going to rely on identity. So we ask for a little bit of help. And that little bit of help is the, um, you know, is the user telling us about their intent for identity. So the data layout that we want most of the time is we want to say, I have an array of points, it has an object header, and then it lays out the data x, y, x, y, x, y. So what kind of code do we want to write to tell the VM that this is the layout that we want? Well, so our plan is you say, this is a value class. You're saying, as the programmer, I don't care about the identity. I only care about the data. Um, and therefore, the VM is able to say, OK, well, if you only care about the data, I can compress away all those allocations, all those object headers, all those pointers, all those indirections, and just give you this layout, which is great. So sometimes we're just programming with data. We just have pure data aggregates. We don't care about their identity. Um, we want to compare them by their state rather than by their uh, identity. We don't care about representational polymorphism. Um, we, just, we just want the data, right? And if, we, um, if we're willing to give up the, uh, some of those things, give up on identity, which means giving up on mutability and polymorphism, which is often quite common, we're willing to do, we don't need the object header. We don't need the indirection. We can flatten values into other objects, other values into arrays, and have them have the performance behavior of primitives. And you know that's that's what we want. Um, so when we think about values versus primitives, you know th there's a lot of differences, right? Primitives can't have basically any of the things classes can have. Values, well, can have a lot of the things classes have. They can have methods, they can have fields, they can implement interfaces, they can use encapsulation, they can use generics. Um, and so we, we can deliver a lot, of these, um, a lot of the runtime behavior of primitives with a lot of the flexibility of being able to write things as classes. Um, and so you could think of values as either being faster objects with some restrictions or as user-defined primitives with behavior and customizable representation and what have you. And our sort of uh, mantra for this is codes like a class works like an int. So you're able to write a value class that has structure, it has methods, it has behavior, it has uh, encapsulation, but then when it hits the heap, it behaves more like an int. Okay, so it really is mostly a performance feature, um, but it's a, it's a performance feature that lets you say what you mean without uh, messing up your code and making it unreadable and unmaintainable. So, okay, so who cares? Who cares about value types? My claim is that everybody cares about value types, either directly or indirectly. Application writers who have large volumes of data, machine learning, big data, they can write code where they can reason better about locality and footprint. Library writers are going to be all over this, right? So the, the implementation of HashMap, I can make it faster with value types. And everybody gains from HashMap being faster because everybody uses HashMap. And the same thing is true with classes like big integer or optional. Um, we can turn these into values and make them more efficient without giving up any of their behavior. Uh, compiler writers love this as a feature because if you're writing a compiler for a language that has, say, tuples, Values are an ideal compilation target for tuples, or for multiple return, or for alternate numeric types, or for dealing better with native. So everybody's going to benefit one way or another, directly or indirectly, from value types. So OK, so where are we? I've said all this before. You're probably uh, wondering you know, what, 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 what's new. So what's new is, uh, in the last four years, we've actually built five rounds of prototypes. And the purpose of each of these prototypes was to learn a specific thing. Um, and we learned from each of them. So the current prototype, which uh, is currently called L World One for reasons that don't really matter, um, has validated the VM underpinnings um, of, of this story, which is really important, uh, and, and shown that we can write code with ordinary value classes, flatten the layout, get all the JIT optimizations, scalarization that we expect, and expose enough language support to make it actually usable. Um, and so the next round of prototype, which we expect is going to be early access in some single digit number of months kind of time frame will actually have compiler support where you know you can write out value classes and maybe even use generics with them. Um, the more advanced applications like specialized generics, those will be coming later. 
<laughs> but let me give you, um, you know, some uh, some sample results uh, to show that this is real. Um, and Mark did this demo in his talk on Wednesday, so I'm not going to do it as a demo. I'll just show you the code. Imagine you have uh, matrices of complex numbers. So, well, we can write a class for a complex number. It has a real and an imaginary component. And uh, the, the definition of addition and multiplication is straight out of your complex analysis textbook, page one. Um, but the negative thing about it is because this is a class, we're allocating things every time we add or multiply. And we're accessing that data on the other side of a pointer. Now, if we want to multiply uh, uh, two matrices, we can do this in the obvious um, you know, cubic algorithm sort of way. There are better algorithms, but this is, this is meant to be simple. And again, what do we have to do? We have to allocate a big array, and each time we add or, um, or multiply, we're going, to, um, we're going to do another allocation. So this is the kind of thing for which value types are ideal, right? This value types are supposed to save us. So let's look at the benchmark results. These um, are typical benchmark results, which means you shouldn't believe anything. Um, these came off of Mark's laptop, which is a fairly recent you know, uh, i7 laptop, not some special you know, uh, high power, big iron system that we have in Iraq somewhere, an actual real machine. And we ran this using the obvious code and then inserting the one keyword value in front of the definition of complex, and we ran it again. And we saw some you know, really nice results, um, and I want to drill into them a little bit. So the, um, the runtime of multiplying 100 by 100, or is it 500 by 500 uh, matrix? 500 by 500 matrix, uh, which is quite large, uh, 12 times faster, which is about what we expected um, uh, for getting rid of the boxing penalty. So that's really nice. The amount of allocation during this went down by a factor of 1,000 because we were able to, the, the, the JIT was able to hoist all these calculations into registers, and we didn't need to allocate any new complex objects. We did need to allocate the big matrix for the, uh, the results, so there was some allocation. It didn't go to zero. But the really interesting thing is these last two numbers, um, which is uh, look at how the, um, the difference between the amount of runtime and the number of instructions we executed. So in the value version, we executed uh, a third as many instructions. But the runtime got 12 times better. Why is that? Well, it got 12 times better um, because we were able to keep the cores fed with data. And what we see in the instructions per cycle metric is, yes, instead of getting on the order of one instruction per cycle on this um, i7 system that can actually do four arithmetics at once, we got almost three instructions per cycle. So all of the theoretical stuff that I showed you in that picture of this is what the memory layout looks like, and this is the cost of chasing one of those pointers, are borne out by the benchmarks. And as a result, we're able to keep the cores busy, fed with data, because we're not busy chasing pointers, waiting for the memory subsystem to cough up our data. So these are really nice numbers, and these are pretty close to ideal numbers. Uh, it's pretty close to what you'd get if you wrote the obvious handwritten C-like code in Java uh, instead of the nice object-oriented code. So all the benefits of writing them as classes with all of uh, encapsulation and access control and all of that, and then all the performance of C. So pretty good deal. So, okay, so where are we? Um, you know, uh, Amber has already delivered several features, two of them as uh, preview features in, uh, in Java 12, and there's lots more coming. Um, Valhalla is starting to bear fruit after years in the lab. We're getting solid results on real code, um, and we expect to see EA builds of this you know, fairly soon. And uh, if you went to the Panama and Loom talks, these have been making huge strides as well. So come back next year and judge us on our progress. Thank you very much. Now, we're theoretically out of time, but they haven't kicked us out of the room yet. So if people want to ask questions before security carries me off, I can, I can try to answer some of them. Uh, question over here. Um, will, will the GVM be able to detect value types if we as developers forget them? So, so it optimizes it for us? So, so the question is, can the JVM figure out something as a value type without us telling them? So for years, we tried to do that. We have optimizations like escape analysis that attempt to say, does the code make any dependencies on the identity of the object? And that stuff works sort of in a limited way. 
but it falls off a cliff fairly rapidly. It's not very predictable. So sometimes you get the benefit of, of that, but very often you don't. And so value types say, I promise you, I will never use the identity. And that enables the JIT to deterministically do all these optimizations that it could only do speculatively before. So uh, there were attempts, but you know, we needed to do this. We needed help from the programmer. Other questions? Question in the aisle. So the question is, what about the integer class? Are we willing to turn that into a value type? It's not a matter of willingness. It's a matter of, can we figure out how in a way that doesn't break the billions of lines of Java code that are out there? So in real world horrible Java code, such as you know, the frameworks on which many of our applications are deployed, uh, you will see things like people locking on integers. They shouldn't do that. It's not clear what it means. but if that started throwing an exception, you can be sure that we would be getting bug reports. So we would love to be able to retire the old box classes, give them a nice gold watch, and set them out to pasture. We're going to do as much as we can within the constraints of not breaking existing code. But can you then, ask, can you then do the other thing? Can you put the methods, can you take the methods from the integer and, class and put them in? Yeah, the yeah. All right, so the second question is, so can we lift methods onto the primitives as if they were value types? Yes, we absolutely can. Maybe we will, maybe we won't, but absolutely we can. More questions? Uh, front row, over here. Sealed classes. The question is, what about sealed classes? All right, sealed classes are cool. I didn't have a lot of time to talk about it, but in a nutshell, a sealed class is one that says, these are my subtypes and that's it. A shape is a circle, a triangle, a rectangle, and nothing else. And you try to extend one and you get a compilation error. Um, so if you declare a sealed class, then the compiler can reason about all the subtypes and reason about exhaustiveness in a pattern switch where you cover the circle and, and rectangle and triangle cases and, and it can know that you've covered the, the waterfront. So uh, yes, that's in the works. It's actually not a terribly complicated feature. It goes very nicely with another feature that is a little more complicated. So we probably will deliver them together, um, which is records. You can think of them as some types and product types, which together make algebraic data types. It's coming, not sure when, but we're on it. Gentleman over here with the beard. Uh, is there any way to turn uh, the preview feature for only my code and disable the preview feature for libraries? So the question is, uh, what kind of control do we have over the preview features? Can I enable them for my code, but disable them for libraries? Um, so when you compile your code, you can turn preview features on. When you run it, you have to turn preview features on, but there isn't a way to say preview features okay in these classes, not okay in those classes. So there isn't a fine-grained control over it. Um, I suppose that you could write some tooling to look at those class, you know, look at those library classes and make sure that they don't use preview features. It's actually quite easy looking at the class file to do so because it uses the class file version as a way of indicating that. You could recompile the libraries, or you could grovel over the class files and look at the class file version for each, which is like the simplest ASM program you could write, and say, D uh, have they enabled the, the, uh, the preview feature bit? Gentleman in the red shirt. Uh, just a silly question, but uh, with the backfix, OK, we can have the strings nicely formatted and so on, except for the first line. Except for the first line, yeah. So the, the question is, uh, the question is, Boy, it's fantastic that we finally have raw and multi-line strings. And it's even more fantastic that we have library support for alignment and trimming. But, oh, I have to like put a blank line at the beginning. Why can't you give me everything I want? Right, that's your question. Um, so the, 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 we, we, we bashed our heads against that for a long time. And there are a lot of examples where if we tried to support that, I could show you examples where it is very difficult to discern the true intent of the developer of which do they want. And so we tried to, we erred on the side of picking something that was more deterministic rather than attempting to read the mind of the, the users. And so you, you can't get everything exactly you want, but... Do you think that could be addressed in the IDE? Uh, the IDE could help you, yeah. But uh, I, I, I think what you're looking for is fundamentally impossible. So we decided to solve a simpler problem. <laughs> Question over here. Yeah, I would be interested what a deconstructor would actually look like. 
Yes, you would be interested in what the uh, declaration syntax of a deconstructor actually looks like. I am very interested in the same question. When I know, you'll know. Uh, so two more questions, this gentleman here and this gentleman here. Yeah, so the question is, man, you're introducing all these new keywords and you're taking all the good words, like var and record. I have code full of these, these, these words, right? So yes, we understand this. These are actually not new keywords. Uh, var is not a keyword, it is a restricted type name. So if you had any types called lowercase var, sorry, you're out of luck, but that seems fairly unlikely. Uh, but if you had variables or methods called var, no problem. We don't see, you know, we're, we're not interpreting that as the var keyword, we're in interpreting that as an identifier. Similarly, for things like record, there's a notion in the language um, specification uh, called conditional keywords or context sensitive keywords, where they are keywords for the purposes of certain grammar productions, but uh, not for the purposes of declaring variables and methods and what have you. So if you have variables called record, not a problem. So we got your back. So we had one more question here, this gentleman here. So the question is, um, did you consider, instead of treating um, instance of with patterns as a language construct, to try to treat it as a library mechanism that can return optional? Um, so there's a couple things wrong with that. One is it kind of falls apart when you get to more sophisticated patterns than simple type patterns. Um, and the other is, well, that may not be what people want all the time, right? So if you're coming from a functional background and your immediate impulse is uh, anything that's a partial function, I'm gonna case over some and none, and of course, that's how every programmer in every language everywhere always wants to do it, then you will ask the question that you asked. But that's not how Java developers necessarily think, and asking Java developers to do it that way is often asking them to do it in a more roundabout way than saying, if you're a thing that has these characteristics, extract all of the stuff that I care about it, and now just execute this block of code. So this is a good example of, this is a concept that was popularized in functional programming. Functional idioms encourage you to write your code in a certain way. Java doesn't necessarily encourage you to write that code that way, and so we did it in a way that we thought was more consistent with the way people program in Java. So we may have borrowed the concepts, we may have said these concepts are a nice fit for Java, but that's not going and copying a feature, that's copying the inspiration for a feature and deriving the right feature in Java from that. So, okay, I think that's good. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next year.